Well, I'll say a little bit about myself. Uh, one or two people already know me, and it's nice to see some of you here. Uh, I'm the county moss recorder of Staffordshire. And whilst I'm interested in moss, I'm also interested in butterflies. And of course, as you know, butterflies are just lousy day flying moths anyway. So uh, it makes sense that uh, we have a talk which uh, links those together. So they've never been more popular, butterflies. Uh, membership of butterfly conservation alone has now reached over 33,000 and is growing at about 3,000 a year. So butterfly conservation are the RSPB equivalent for butterflies, if you like. And added to that, we've got something like 110,000 people who take part annually in the big butterfly camp. So it's one of the first groups of insects, I think, which people become interested in. And um, so it's a good way of getting in into other groups of insects, if you like. We've got 59 species of butterfly in the UK, but two and a half thousand species of moths. So you can see butterflies are far outweighed by moths, uh, but they have taken the, well, the, 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 they are the, the group which is of most interest to people, mainly because they're day flying, they're brightly colored, I suppose. And the number of books on identifying butterflies is far greater than uh, there is on moths. But I'm hoping to re remedy that with a future talk on moths anyway. After that 59, there are about 44 species in the West Midlands in the last 25 years, uh, with 40 of those breeding regularly. Six species have expanded their range. Uh, we've all heard doom and gloom about butterfly numbers falling, but there are some which are doing very well, and you can see those there. And But 10 have undergone a contraction in range or uh, in, in numbers, and we'll talk about that as we go through. Butterflies and moths are related. They're all members of the Lepidoptera, and they share a number of things in common, one of which are these tiny scales, which you see a magnified version of there, which cover the whole body. These scales contain uh, colored pigments in some cases. Some of them have very fine striations or lines on them, which uh, help to give some of the interference colors that you see on some of the rather sort of shiny butterflies. The life cycle of a Lepidopteran, whether it's a butterfly or moth, follows a similar uh, style. We start off with the eggs, which can be variously uh, colored and uh, marked. We then get to the caterpillar, which then goes to the chrysalis and then to the adult uh, butterfly. So that's the typical life cycle and it's exhibited by the large white in this case. Throughout this talk, we're going to see this diagram. So I thought I'd just put it up in big so you can see what it's all about. It tells us the life cycle of the butterfly concern. And you can see here that from April to May, this butterfly is on the wing, it's flying. And during that period, uh, it starts to lay its eggs in May and June. Those eggs hatch out into larvae in June and July. Those larvae go into a chrysalis and that is how this butterfly spends the rest of the year. The whole winter there's a chrysalis and it starts to hatch out from that chrysalis in April, May, June. So not all butterflies follow this scheme and we'll have a look at that with uh, as we go through. But this is the diagram in big so you can see what it's about. So I'm going to start off with the common species of butterfly, the ones that you're likely to see uh, just in your garden or out walking somewhere. And the most common one, I suppose, most people are familiar with is the large white or cabbage white. We've got four species of all white butterfly, which we see, and one or two others which are 
sort of related. We'll come on to those in a minute. But the large white is big. It's got black coming all the way down the wing, halfway down the wing. You'll see why that's important in a minute. The sexes are different. The male has no spots on its wing. The female has got two. If we look at the life cycle of the large white, we'll see that it spends the winter as a chrysalis. And they hatch out in April, May, laying their eggs in May and June. The larvae come out in June, start to eat your early sprouts or whatever. And then they turn into a pupae, and that pupae hatches into an adult who lays more eggs and there's more larvae. So we've got two broods in a year. And they're also joined by migrant species. Uh, butterflies which come in and in the past this species used to be a real plague and you there are reports of clouds white clouds approaching the east coast of England uh, that was before the days of insecticides I suppose and uh, I suppose we have to be lucky for that but these days um, numbers are, not, are still a pest and they can devour your entire crop of uh, brassicas, um, if you're not careful. But there is a small little parasitic wasp which tends to feed and lays eggs in the caterpillars of this species. And uh, that helps to control the, the numbers of uh, large white. But even underneath, you can see the black coming right the way down the wing to here. And you'll see why that's important with this next species, which is the small white. And there, the black is only coming a fraction, a third down the wing, even a quarter of the way down the wing. This is a male with the one spot, female with two spots. But this species itself is a, a bit of a pest. Um, but unlike the large white, which lays its eggs in groups, this lays its eggs singly or in scattered, uh, scattered over the leaf. And you see, here's a fresh one. And as it ages, it turns yellow. And here's the caterpillar, which is quite different to the cabbage white caterpillar we saw earlier. And this will start to feed on your cabbage and burrow its way into the center of the cabbage and eat it away without probably you noticing until it's too late. Um, so it can be a pest species, uh, the small white. The third white species is, is not a pest, but it gets called a pest by association, I suppose. Uh, this is the green veined white, and you can see why it's called green veined. You've got these veins. They're not actually green, they're sort of a mixture of yellow and black uh, scales, which make it look greenish. But the heavy veining is typical of green veined white, including the black down the edge here. It's not continuous, but it's in little pockets. And this butterfly looks superb from underneath. You can see these lovely veins. And it's quite uh, harmless in gardens. It feeds in the wild on things like uh, jack by the head or hedge mustard, uh, hedge garlic, or ladies smock, which it's sitting on here. Now, it, quite often butterflies are associated with certain types of habitat uh, and certain types of food plant. And here are two food plants which could be applied to the green veined white. You just see this is lady smock and this is hedge garlic or jack by the hedge. Common species in the spring in damp meadows or in hedgerows. And this is the food plant of this. This is our orange tip. Male and female are quite different to look at, but uh, underneath they both have this rather nice cryptic camouflage. And this is the butterfly who you've already seen the life cycle of earlier on as an example. It only flies in April, May and June. So if you want to see orange tips, uh, sometimes late March possibly, uh, it's a spring species and it spends most of the year as a, as a chrysalis as you can see there. This is one of the species where you can find the eggs quite easily. And here's an egg laid 
uh, on a cuckoo flower or lady smock, and it's bright orange. And if you look at these plants in about April time, uh, they are really noticeable, these bright yellow uh, eggs. And you see the same one here on Jack by the Hedge. Normally, they only lay single eggs, or there may be one or two. Um, that's to avoid competition from the larvae eating the, the whole plant too quickly, I suppose. Uh, a plant which we don't see much of in Staffordshire, or not very common, it's uh, alder buckthorn. Uh, and that's the food plant of this other species, which is in the white, uh, the uh, brimster, brimstone. And the brimstone is the butterfly you look out for in the spring because it is on the wing in February on a nice sunny day. And you'll see here, this faded orange is to indicate that this butterfly spends the winter as an adult in hibernation. It may be in a tree and amongst the ivy or somewhere like that. It comes out in the spring and it's a glorious sight to see this yellow butterfly flying amongst the trees when there are no leaves on them. And it will be on the wing right the way through to May. And it doesn't start to lay its eggs till about June uh, on this alder buckthorn or purging buckthorn. The two species of buckthorn, not particularly common plants. So the butterfly itself is not that common. But it does wander quite a, lot, a long way looking for something to lay its eggs on. But if you go to Derbyshire, you'll see a lot more of these on the limestone where uh, all the buckthorn and common buckthorn are much more uh, abundant. So that's a brimstone. The only other one left in this group, and it's not a very common one, and you might see this anywhere because it's a migrant. Uh, cloudy jellos can turn up anywhere, and being a migrant, they're common some years, and other years you never see a single one. Um, and they tend to look for clovers and uh, alfalfa fields and stuff like that for, to lay their eggs on. But you see here it's on purple loose strife. Uh, here it's on knapweed. Uh, so they will visit other flowers. OK. We all know what this is, nettle. Nettle is one of the most important plants for butterflies that we've got because it's a food plant of some of our biggest and uh, favorite butterflies, if you like. First one is the peacock. Peacock butterfly is a fairly local species. I don't think we get any immigrants. I may be wrong there, but on the whole, I think the um, fairly sedentary butterflies that don't fly long distances. But you'll see here, they overwinter as an adult. So in amongst ivy, outbuildings and so on, they spend the winter. And then they start to emerge on sunny days in the spring and then lay their eggs uh, here. And they turn into caterpillars like these. And uh, sometimes in vast numbers on a single plant or group of plants. Uh, and underneath, you'll see they're quite well camouflaged. So that's peacock. The other one which we're all familiar with is small tortoiseshell. And again, this is another species which spends the winter in hibernation, coming out in favorable days in the spring. And you'll see the eggs are laid twice. So we've got two broods of this during the year, but <coughs> the numbers are reinforced by migrants from abroad, sometimes in large numbers. Last year, I think, was a very good year for small tortoiseshells, but the numbers of small tortoiseshells have dropped quite a lot. And one theory is it's to do with this fly here. This fly lays its eggs on nettles. The larvae of the fly hatch out and then go and attack the caterpillars uh, of the uh, butterfly who's just laid its eggs on the nettles and there so parasitize the caterpillars and kill them off. And this, there's some thought that this may be partially due to uh, cause of their decline. But over the last 10 years, numbers have dropped considerably of this once common species. Similar to small tortoiseshell, we've got the uh, comma. And here's the comma mark. This is a species which used to feed on hop. And in the old days, was a very, very common butterfly because hops used to be grown all over the place because every village used to have its own brew house. 
that went out of fashion, hops disappeared, and so did the butterfly, almost to the verge of extinction in England, just hanging on in the Welsh borders. But it's come back. Uh, maybe the climate's got something to do with it. And it, it now seems to favour nettles. So that's a comma. Oops. Another one in this group, again, is a migrant. And some years we see them, some years we don't. Uh, painted ladies. Painted ladies are one of the most successful butterflies in the world, really. Um, the ones we see in this country, they uh, migrants. They come from Africa, Arabia. And they fly over in the spring direct, straight over. And then in subsequent broods, they come over in a series of uh, hatchings on the continent, working their way up, and then they come over to the British Isles. You'll see from this uh, next picture here, there's nothing in the winter. They can't survive our winter. Uh, the larvae uh, can only survive up to about over five degrees C, so really it's not suitable over here for them. But there is evidence in recent years that these butterflies make a return migration at about 3,000 feet, which is why we've never bothered to see them before. But recent advances in radar have enabled us to see these things flying back to the continent, in which they do in a series of uh, sort of hops and broods. Even uh, there's evidence of them crossing the Sahara uh, to winter south of the Sahara. But I gather this is probably the sort of habitat you'd find them breeding in. And uh, quite an amazing butterfly. I've seen, we saw them in Canada last year. Uh, they're everywhere. Another common species in the garden is the Red Admiral. And about 10 years ago, this bit here would have been white because these butterflies were unable to winter in our country. Uh, but with the mild winters we've been having, the mild weather, there's now evidence of overwintering of red admirals. So they can find them in the spring. But most of the red admirals here will be birds, uh, butterflies which have flown over from the continent. And similarly here, these will be uh, local but butterflies were also reinforced by migrants. But growing numbers are overwintering now. This plant, everybody knows, is honeysuckle. And I put this in because this is the food plant of a butterfly which is spreading. And it's something you may fi well find down in the uh, valleys, that uh, in Trent Valleys. Um, and it's a food plant of this rather splendid butterfly. This is the, uh, the white admiral. Uh, if you go down to the wire forest, it's quite common. It now occurs on Highgate Common in Staffordshire. Um, and it's working its way upwards. So it's something to look out for. It likes woodland rides. It nectars on bramble flowers. But it lays its eggs on honeysuckle, but not the big blousy honeysuckle in the sunshine, but it tends to want the honeysuckle that's in the shade or semi-shade, the spindly plants, it seems. Something to look out for anyway, white admiral. This is the food plant. This and some of its relatives are the food plant of some of our most sought after butterflies and ones which are not very common in Staffordshire. Whether you'll see this in the Trent Valley or not, I don't know, but it is in the Sherbrooke Valley, which is not far off the Trent Valley um, at Shrugbury. This is the Sherbrooke Valley Canic Chase, and this is the small pearl border fritillary. And they're called pearl borders, obviously, because they have these pearl like borders, and they do like, look like mother of pearl. Uh, they feed on violets. This one will feed on the marsh violet. It tends to be in Staffordshire, certainly in marshy uh, valley bottoms, uh, but you can find it in other habitats. Uh, it's very similar to the, the pearl border fertility, which we don't get in our area, but it is in the wire forest. So whether you'll see this or not, I don't know, but I'll just put it in uh, just for completeness. And this is the first butterfly we've met so far, which spends the winter as a larva rather than as a chrysalis or an adult.
but you can see it's only on the wing for a very short period of time, June and July, possibly August, in a good year. This is one which is spreading. It's a butterfly of oak woodland and with wide rides and lots of bramble to nectar on. Silver wash fertility is one of our biggest butterflies. And it's something to look out for. We've had them at uh, Wolsey Bridge. Uh, we even had one in our garden here in Stone briefly. So they do wander away from their normal habitats. But again, it's something to keep your eye on. As is this one, the dark green fertility. This has just started to become a regular species in North, North Staffordshire on the moorland. Um, I've seen it in Dovedale. Um, so it's, so again, a species that's spreading and may well wander down here, but not common in our country. We talked about nettle being important. One of the other important food plants uh, for butterflies is grass. Uh, but it's important where the grass is growing as to which species it attracts. So if you've got grass growing in a woodland environment like this with dappled light coming through, there's only one butterfly that uh, evokes, and that's this one. This is the speckled wood. Speckled wood has two broods during the year. It has a spring brood where the yellow spots are much bigger. That's because more light's getting through to the ground. And in the autumn, the spots are a bit smaller, um, much more cover overhead. And these butterflies will sit like this, waiting for the fe a female to pass. Or if another male passes, they'll spiral up in a sort of fight. Uh, if we look at the, um, the, the life cycle, you'll see here something that's unique amongst all the butterflies. And that is that this butterfly spends the winter in two different phases, either as a, a chrysalis or as a larva. I'm not sure why it should be. Maybe it's a way of hedging your bets. If it's a bad year, uh, a chrysalis can't move, but a larva can to get out of the, into shelter. I'm not sure. Maybe other people on the course today who have got a theory about that. But you can see it's on the wing right the way through from March through to October. So several broods. Grass growing like this, what a wonderful sight. This is um, a, a park or country park, uh, just on the outskirts of Longton, Stoke and Trent. Uh, that evokes one of our commonest grassland butterflies, and that's the meadow brown. The meadow brown, can be abundant at times, and it's the butterfly is doing really well. Uh, you can see here that it's on the wing June, June to August. Uh, spends the winter the winter as a caterpillar. Note these two eyes, two white this white spot, one white spot and a black circle. So that's important in a minute when we look at another butterfly. So this is a meadow brown. One which is people get mixed up with, which they shouldn't do really, because it's only about two thirds the size and bright orange, is the gatekeeper, which likes grassland, but grassland maybe wears some hedgerows as well. Uh, and it's got two, two white spots here, orange in the middle. And this black area here tells me that this is a male, because these are scenting scales, scent receptors or emitters. A female doesn't have those. And if we look at the underneath, you can see two white spots, gatekeeper, one, right, one white spot, meadow brown. And also you've got the white spots here. But gatekeeper, meadow brown are both doing really well. Another butterfly which has really increased in our area, I can't say for Derbyshire, but for, certainly for Staffordshire, this butterfly 40 years ago was restricted to the areas around Nosal in the south of um, just off the A5. Uh, and uh, that was it. And in the last 10 or 15 years, it suddenly exploded, if you like, and is all over the place and could be one of the commonest butterflies. It's a grassland feeder, but grass where it's uh, 
in a sort of slightly shady area, maybe the edge of a wood or something like that. You don't often see them right out in the middle of a field, but you can see where it gets its name from, this lovely ringlet of, uh, on the underside, but you can see it even here as well. Another butterfly, which is a typical grassland butterfly, is the small heath. And this is one which is not doing well. Its numbers seem to be dropping, and I don't know why. It's our, one of our smallest butterflies. And when it lands, it lands like this, and then slowly it lowers these wings until you can't see it at all. I've never ever seen one of these without its wings closed like this. They never sit with them open. But small heath, typical of uh, grassland, but numbers are declining a bit. One which is spreading and you need to look out for it now is the marbled white. I mean, if you live in the south of England, you'd think, what's the fuss about? Because they're really common. But around here, they're not. Uh, and uh, it's now on Cannock Chase. There's a small colony on Cannock Chase. I've had records from Swinnerton up here. So certainly down in the Trent Valley, it's something to look out for uh, this summer. Um, marbled white, what a beautiful butterfly. This grassland here, which is very thin, it's nibbled by sheep, trodden by sheep to reveal bare areas here, is typical habitat of this grassland species. This is the wall. And uh, this is a species which has declined as well. And again, I don't know why that is, whether it's uh, to do with climate, I'm not sure. But if you go to the coast, it's really common still. But inland numbers uh, are just really down. I haven't seen one in Staffordshire for ages. But it's quite typical, these lovely ringlets here and underneath it's just as pretty. Um, so it's really important if you do see these to send in your records of them. The second group of woodland butterflies are quite different in shape. As you can see, these have got stout bodies, stout wings. Uh, these are the skippers. And there are three what we call golden skippers in, in our area. And they're all, as the name suggests, they're all golden brown like this and look very, very similar. The biggest one is the large skipper. And this is distinguished by this sort of variegated pattern on the wings. They've got dark and light areas here. Same on this one. But this one's a male because it's got these scenting scales here. The female doesn't have them. But the skippers all sit in this peculiar position with their wings at four wings at an angle like this. And they'll sit on a stem here and go and attack anything which passes. And they fly really quickly. Uh, we can tell this is a female because she just laid an egg here on the grass. Um, here we see that uh, they spend the winter as a larvae and they're out in June and July and, and into August. You can see the wing pattern here, how, the way they sit. So that's a large skipper. And smaller than the large skipper is the small skipper, surprisingly. And um, this, again, wings at an angle, but the wings are uniform. They're not variegated, they're orange completely. This is a male with his scenting scales. This is a female uh, without them. Now, until about, what, 15 years ago, this would have been it for more golden skippers. But now we've got another one. And this is the Essex skipper. Uh, it's called Essex skipper because it was first picked up from a species uh, specimen down in Essex, but it's spreading like wildfire and it looks like a small skipper. But look at its antennae. These are uh, got black tips as if the antennae have been dipped in an inkwell. Whereas a small skipper has got brown tips to its antennae. And you might think, oh, the hell am I going to see that? but they do sit still long enough for you to actually get a look at that. Um, so do look out for it next time you see a golden brown skipper, look out for this dipped in ink um, antennal tip. So 
moving on to a slightly different habitat. This is bare ground, uh, waste ground it could be, old brownfield site, an old factory site which is grown over. This is MOD Swinton. Swinton. And quite often one of the plants that grows there quite a lot is this, the bird spot trefoil. And that's the food plant of a number of skippers and other butterflies we're going to come on to. One of which is this one. This is the dingy skipper. <coughs> and um, the dingy skipper is probably our dingiest or butterfly, but it's quite small, but flies very quick. So it's not often noticed. But when the weather sun goes in, it'll sit on a stem of a flower or plantain in this case, where it looks quite moth-like. But numbers of this are dropping. Uh, it's no longer as uh, common as it used to be. But it's one which is worth looking out for where you've got a, an old disused site with lots of bird's foot trefoil. And uh, another skipper which feeds on uh, two common plants. This is wild strawberry. And then this is a. Uh, uh, sink foil, uh, creeping sink foil, uh, is this one. Uh, this is one of our rarest butterflies in Staffordshire. There's only one site I know where this occurs, and that's MOD Swinton. Uh, but if you do find it in the Trent Valley, it's certainly worth making a note of. Uh, it's a delightful little butterfly, but they, they do luckily sit. Uh, they fly like crazy but they do occasionally sit. And once they sit in, that's it. They don't tend to move. So you can get some quite good, good photographs of them. That habitat, again, with the low grass and bird's foot trefoil and so on, can also attract this one, which is, again, one of our most beautiful butterflies. Uh, the small copper uh, doesn't feed on trefoil. It feeds on, uh, on sorrel, common sorrel which is a quite a typical plant of grassland. And uh, here you see the underside, quite an unmistakable uh, butterfly. So small copper. And then one of our most beautiful butterflies, <coughs> again, the same sort of habitat, feeding on bird's foot trefoil, uh, is the common blue. And the common blue, Males are unmistakable. They're all blue. The females are rather brown with very thin bits of orange here. You'll see why that's important in a minute. But that's doing quite well some years, a uh, couple of years, last couple of years, we've seen quite a few locally. Uh, always a delight to see common blue. And here we see they're on the wing from May right through to October with two broods and they spend the winter as a larvae. Most of the blue species have some sort of association with ants. The ants, uh, the, the caterpillars are laid near an ant's nest and the caterpillars exude a sort of sweet substance which ants like and they take the caterpillars back into their nests and they have a sort of pheromone on the caterpillars which prevents the ants from sort of attacking them. And then they go into the nest and scavenge inside the nest. I'm not sure. I think they may even attack the larvae as well of the ants. Uh, common blue doesn't have quite so strong an association with ants as some of the others like large blue or um, uh, that sort of thing. Very similar to the female common blue, and one which is spreading in our area, is the uh, brown argus. Brown argus is a species you associate with two habitats. One is up in the limestone, but some are the lowland meadows, so Trent Valley is an ideal place to look out for this species. Unlike the common blue, the brown here is much more obvious, and it's got this lovely white border to it. But it's, uh, it's the underneath which sort of gives it away in a way. It's, uh, it, uh, you need to see the underside of the wing. This is what I call my Christmas butterfly because the caterpillars of this butterfly feed on holly. 
and on ivy. So holly and the ivy mean holly blue butterfly. So this butterfly is quite interesting. It has two broods, but both broods feed on different food plants, which is unusual. So the spring brood of holly blue, uh, this is the uh, female with the black border, and this is the male here. Uh, the female uh, in the spring lays her eggs on holly. They hatch out into larvae and butterflies who then lay their eggs in the second brood on ivy. And then they spend the winter uh, as a chrysalis. But underneath you see it's fairly gray, quite unlike the common blues, which are lovely variegated uh, oranges and browns. This is the butterfly you're going to get in your garden, really, if you get a blue butterfly, it's probably this one. Now, this next species, I'm not convinced you're going to get in the Trent Valley, and I only put it in because <coughs> we did have one in our garden here in Stone. And this is where I normally associate this next species. This is Canuck Chase, area of heathland, and home to the green hair streak butterfly. And it feeds on a wide range of food plants, uh, and I suppose it can stray some distance. So, in theory, there's a chance you may come across it, uh, but it's, it's something to look out for. Um, again, it spends the winter as a chrysalis, and it's only out in May and June. So, if you want to see this butterfly, and you can see it in some large numbers on Canuck Chase, uh, it's not in the Trent Valley, I know, but it's not far away. Uh, do go and have a look. One but butterfly to look out for in the Trent Valley, and it's an important one to look out for, is the <coughs> white letter hair streak. And it's important because it's disappearing. It's disappearing because its food plant is this. This is witch elm. And since the demise of the elms in the 60s, the fortunes of this butterfly have just plummeted. And it will still feed on witch elm growing in hedgerows, but the numbers are very depleted. So butterfly which spends its days in the tops of the trees feeding on honeydew, but in a really dry year, it will come down and feed on thistles uh, and so on. Um, so do look out for it. We've had it in our garden. We've got it locally here in Stone. But, uh, Anywhere where there's witch elm is worth looking out for this in the summer. But of course, you can also look for its eggs now uh, if you want to. Uh, you'll find those on the twigs of uh, witch elms near a bud or something like that. Here it is. This one spends its winter as an egg, unlike the others. But it's only on the wing June and July when the, the hottest parts of the year. One butterfly which is associated with oak woodland in particular is the purple hair streak. And like the white letter hair streak, it spends most of its time in the treetops. Uh, but when it does come down low in perhaps in late in the evening or when the sun goes in, um, you stand a chance of seeing at least the underside, even if it doesn't open its wings uh, to reveal this lovely sheen and again at this time of year it's worth looking for the eggs which might be laid near the bud of an oak um, delightful butterfly doing quite well i think that's a quick tour of the butterflies the common ones what if you want to find out a bit more about butterflies well there's various websites there's the uh, butterfly conservation <coughs> But you will need a good field guide. This one's quite good. Lots of nice pictures and uh, identification features. But this one's good too. This is the uh, West Midlands branch of butterfly conservation. They brought out this guide to the butterflies <coughs> covering Black Country, Birmingham, Herefordshire, Shropshire, Staffordshire, Worcestershire. But it's also got guided walks in that you can follow to um, look for butterflies. Become a member of Butterfly Conservation, you get a lovely 
regional magazine, The Comma, which got details of work parties and so on. And finally, if you want to get involved, and that's part of the reason for the Trent Valley Partnership is to encourage people to take part in recording and jotting down and telling people what you see. Uh, there is a Butterfly Conservation West Midlands app or Butterfly Conservation app you can use to record on your iPhone in the field or you can use this website here, VRC iRecord. And iRecord is a really useful website because it allows you to record not just butterflies, but also anything, plants, birds, other insect groups. And the idea is it's a, a one-stop shop for recording your sightings. So butterfly conservation can then go into iRecord and extract all the butterfly records for Staffordshire, Warwickshire, Worcestershire, without you having to think, well, who do I send my records to? Uh, you send everything to iRecord and the various recording schemes, county recorders like myself can access iRecord and um, uh, get the data out. You also have got local biological record centers. There's one in Staffordshire, attached to Woolsey Bridge, uh, the Staffordshire Wildlife Trust. They too can get data from iRecord as well, uh, or you can send stuff direct to them. But whenever you're out, remember to record what you've seen and how many there were, whether it's an adult or a larva. Take a photograph if you're not sure. Note when you saw it. Time's really important uh, when you saw it. And where you saw it, ideally a grid reference or a postcode. So finally, what happens to all that data that you've recorded? Obviously, it can be used to produce distribution maps, and they're important uh, to know where. So if you want to preserve or protect something, it's important to know where it is. Not only that, if you do your recording over a period of years, and you can then plot how species are doing in time. So this is the comma butterfly. Uh, in 1970 to 1982, it was where all these purple marks are. But between 1995 and 1999, it's now up here. So all these are new comma sightings. So the comma has expanded its range right up into Scotland. And so by doing this for each species, we can see whether things are doing well. Or conversely, these white dots are where this pearl board fertility used to be seen uh, in 1970, 1990, uh, up to 2009, uh, but are no longer there. So we've lost them. And we can see straight away that this species is not doing well and is receding from quite a large area. If you really want to get involved and you've got the time, you can take on a transit and butterfly conservation are uh, happy for people who can I can commit to regular walkings once, a, I don't know whether it's once a week or once a month, probably every week, along a transect route, recording the number of butterflies, and this all helps to tell us all about trends and so on. So all that data that we've been gathering here uh, goes into producing something like this, the Millennium, Millennium Atlas of Butterflies. And if that's done on a 20 year cycle or 10 year cycle, it then allows us to produce maps like this and this uh, to show how things are doing. So that's all I wanna say about uh, butterflies today. It's something to brighten up a dull evening and a, in the middle of winter, something to look forward to. Our first, um, perhaps our first uh, brimstones will be out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, so if you've got any questions or anything, then uh, yeah, please um, do uh, ask and uh, Nicola will take over from here, I think.
Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. That was that was wonderful. That was really interesting. I'm blown away by the painted lady migration. That something that small can go that far. Yeah, it's amazing. They've even mm. been recorded up in the Arctic. What? You know, it's That's amazing. Uh, with a tailwind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you. So, if anybody did have any questions, um, if you you can use the chat box and I'll read them out, or you can unmute yourself and and ask them uh, in person if you wanted to. So, open to anybody. Has anybody seen a butterfly yet? I haven't, but uh, I think they have already been reported. Um, Dave, I think uh, yeah. I've seen a red admiral and a peacock, I think. So, uh, it, I mean, which amazes me, really, given the cold sort of weather that we've been having over the last uh, a week or two. Well, I was out in the garden today and we saw a uh, seven spot ladybird wandering around. And, uh, oh, right. A few diptera flies on the fence because it was really quite warm today and in, in the sunshine. Um, but, if, no, not... um, if we people wanted to. Uh, provide more butterfly habitat in their gardens i mean i've got quite a small garden what would be the best um the best way to go like the best plants to have or the best kind of habitat to uh, to create <laughs> if you could choose I, i've got quite a small garden if i could choose one thing to do well i mean there's things like budlia there's things like aubrecia which is a low-growing rockery plant which are good for spring butterflies is it, the thing about putting stuff in your garden is that it, it attracts the the adults to feed and nectar doesn't necessarily provide food for the caterpillars and it's so important that if, if there aren't any food for caterpillars you're not going to get any adult butterflies and so it's really important that we try and preserve our rough areas where there's lots of nettles growing you can try a patch of nettles in your garden but i think butterflies are a bit canny they won't lay all their eggs on a small patch of nettles because they know their caterpillars are going to eat them to, uh, to nothing within a very short period of time. They like quite large patches, but it's worth a try. But it's to try and get your local area to be kept, I suppose, unkempt. <laughs> so whatever a better word. I don't uh, know what you'd say, Mike. Um, Mike here on here is representing butterfly conservation who um... i think i think within butterfly conservation we usually sort of try to kind of say to people think of your garden as a, a bit of a sort of butterfly pub you know mm -hmm. where butterflies can pop in for a quick one and then uh, move on i think unless you've got a, a largish garden then you've obviously got um, perhaps more limited opportunities as far as attracting butterflies to breed although having said that I mean, certainly in our um, back garden, um, we have holly blues and um, breeding very regularly on our ivy, um, yeah. which we grow along a, a wall. Um, ivy is a fantastic plant, um, you know, to attract insects generally, because in the autumn, um, you, you, if it's a good year for red admirals, for example, you often find them nectaring on the uh, ivy. But, uh, but certainly um, in terms of attracting holly blues to stay and breed, um, then ivy is a great plant to actually have in your garden. And obviously if you've got holly bushes, either in your garden or roundabout, um, then that's even better because you're providing the habitat for them for both sort of generations. Yeah, I mean, the ivy's good for the overwintering as well, isn't it? It is, yeah. Um... Yes, I mean, you can often find sort of, well, no, I wouldn't say often find, but uh, occasionally you'll come <laughs> across uh, you know, a hibernating uh, um, peacock or, or brimstone, perhaps, um, you know, within sort of some overgrown sort of ivy. So, uh, so ivy, I think, is a, a really sort of undervalued plant. Um, yeah. that we tend to think, as you say, of uh, all these sort of fantastic pollinator plants like buddleia and Michaelmas daisies and so on and obviously it's great to find some space in your garden for those but uh, I think every garden should have a big patch of ivy somewhere. <laughs> Very understated plant, brilliant. We've had a few questions pop up in the chat now actually and I'm aware that it is now eight o'clock so um, I think we're probably going to carry on with the Q&A a little bit because their questions are coming up but if you do have to shoot off at eight o'clock then thank you very much 
for coming. Um, it's it's been really great so far. But um, we will carry on if that's all right, Dave. If you're happy to answer yeah, a few yeah, more questions cool. that are coming in. So yeah. um, Neil's put. I was amazed to know that some butterflies have uh, sleep in areas like sheds, etc. How do we make sure they don't uh, die if they get trapped? Was that is that along the right lines for your questions? There, there, Neil. I mean. Yeah, if they get into your shed, they they're not going to want to move basically until the spring, and when you'll then be going in and out, I presume. Um, so unless you want to leave a window ajar slightly, but um, they will be all right left alone until the the spring, uh, at least over winter. I think people often get um, worried about um, butterflies they suddenly see, you know, flying inside the house during the uh, winter, um, mainly small tortoiseshells, um, which actually will come into uh, houses to uh, to hibernate. And people wonder, well, whatever should they do? You know, because often it's um, perhaps around Christmas when you suddenly bring your spare bedroom into use, you suddenly find a butterfly fluttering up at the uh, at the window. Obviously, to release it that time of year is not a great idea. So what? butterfly conservation generally recommends to people is to try to pick the butterfly up very carefully and remove it to somewhere where perhaps there isn't heating um you know maybe under the stairs or in a um, uh, another spare bedroom um where the butterfly will generally settle down and then can be released um when spring really arrives perhaps in uh, in march or april and the butterfly reawakens i think this is quite interesting isn't it that um, people sort of think, oh, we go and have a lovely mild winter, that would be great for the butterflies, but it's not. I mean, most butterflies are adapted to have a cold winter. Mm. And if they have a mild winter, then you've got a chance for disease or fungal growth on the uh, chrysalises or whatever. Uh, a butterfly can, sp can stand a bit of frost and a bit of snow. It doesn't mind that. What it doesn't like is wet, damp, winters and so the winters we're having not in the last week it's been pretty dire but uh, on the whole of the last five or six years the winters have been fairly mild and that, that's not necessarily good news yeah absolutely um, mm. um it's been a couple more questions then so from joe would alder buckthorn grow in our clay in stone uh yeah i think so it's not I can't say I've actually seen it in the wild round here, but then it's, there's not many of it. And so you've got to have your eye in looking for it. But there's no reason why it wouldn't grow. Give it a go, Jay, give it yeah. a go. Um, from Jonathan, any tips on seeing white letter hair streak? I know they are local, but never can see. Yeah, that's a difficult one. It depends on the weather. If you go a really hot summer, they'll come down and feed on creeping thistle and so on. You want to, first of all, make sure you've got some uh, elms nearby. Uh, they don't travel a long distance, you see, so they'll be sticking around a tree or a group of trees, and they may come down to the ground, and then they go back up into the tree. So first of all, find your witch elms or whatever other elm you've got, uh, and just visit it on sunny days and look at things like thistles or brambles. Um, that's the only way you're going to see them, unless you try and find the, the eggs, uh, which is getting a bit extreme. <laughs> uh, and then we had one more in the chat. Do butterflies only like a particular flower or plant, or do some plants appeal to several species? Yeah, I think most butterflies, um, for nectaring purposes, uh, the certain species of plant which are in flower at certain times of year and it tends to attract anything that's going by. Uh, yellow flowers and white flowers are particularly attractive to butterflies. Um, I think they see colours slightly different than we do. Um, maybe they see ultraviolet colours uh, which are quite strong in yellows and white flowers uh, which we don't necessarily see that but uh, they go for that. Uh, Budleas, you see a so purples, but we've got a purple bud layer. We hardly ever see anything on it, yet somebody down the road might have the same plant and get loads. There's no, um, doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason, but uh, things like brambles, you see 
universally uh, uh, attracting to uh, butterflies. Um, they're white. So you say that, Mike? Would you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's interesting that you, what you mentioned about sort of color preferences. Certainly, certain species seem to go for different sort of uh, shades of plants. Uh, I always think marbled whites, which you mentioned in your talk, which is one of my favourite butterflies, um, often go actually for purple flowers. Mm -hmm. um, you tend to find them on knapweed or um, field scabious. Um, you know, that seems to be a real favourite of, uh, of marbled, uh, marbled whites, uh, whereas species perhaps like the small copper um, are more likely to go for plants in sort of white or, or yellow um, sort of flowering uh, um, range. Um, so yes, I mean, you're quite right, butterflies do see plants rather differently to us, um, but nevertheless, you, if you start to observe them carefully, you do, they do seem to have some preferences yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Between, uh, between plants. Yeah, fab, yeah, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for, for Dave or, or for Mike, as, uh, as Mike's sitting in, um, about, about the talk or about uh, how to get involved in butterfly conservation or more information about transects. I took on an allotment last year and I was amazed at the, actually at the nettles, um, you saying about how important they are and we had peacocks, caterpillars all over them. And yeah, it was, it was really interesting to watch that whole cycle on that plot. Yes, kids. Great for kids as well. It watch the whole uh, cycle. Yeah. Oh, fab. Can I just kind of reiterate the point that Dave's made about recording? Yeah. I mean, it really is absolutely kind of crucial. Um, Staffordshire is not the best recorded county, um, I have to say, for, uh, for butterflies. Um, yet, as um, we've seen in Dave's talk, it does contain a number of important species, some of which I think are, are probably still under-recorded in the county. Um, recording is very, very easy, particularly if you use iRecord, um, either on your smartphone or by um, just making a note of what you see and then putting them on your uh, computer in the evening. And I certainly encourage people um, to do that. Um, it's a sort of well-organized um, scheme in that you can actually submit your photograph along with your record if you're not very sure. And through West Midlands Butterfly Conservation for each county, um, we have a series of what we call verifiers who actually look at your record and check it. Um, and if it's a photograph, they can obviously have a look at that. And if they have a query, then they're able to come back to you. And this data really is important. It's, uh, it helped us to produce our book, which Dave mentioned, The Butterflies of the West Midlands. Um, but also it's really important from a conservation point of view. Um, once we get that kind of information, you know, if um, people alert us to actually planning applications or there's development actually going on, having some good records can actually make a, a big difference. So uh, I think that's really important. And it's a big contribution that uh, everyone can make, I think, by actually recording what they see. Absolutely. Dave, Dave did mention that is one of the, the things that we are working on in, in the triple, triple TV scheme is we have a whole project dedicated to identification and surveying and bridging that gap almost between being able to identify something and doing something with that identification. So so we are doing some work on that and we are um, uh, we are recruiting volunteers. So if you're interested in finding out a bit more about our volunteer opportunities and the training we've got and, and hopefully later in the year we'll be able to go out in the field and do surveys together um we are we are recruiting for volunteers at the moment um uh, so again from jonathan are there any local guided butterfly walks presumably this year it's a bit tricky to be leading groups of guided walks it's a bit un unsure to plan anything Although it's, although it's not scripted, that's just the question I was hoping that somebody was going to ask, <laughs> because we have organised um, an open garden event at the Dorothy Clive Garden, which I'm sure some of you will know. I'm not quite sure whether it fits quite into the Trent Valley or not. Um, Where is it? You know your boundaries. The no. Dorothy Clive Garden, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's sort of west of Stone and um, east of Market 
Creighton. Um, it's not far away if it's if it's not quite in your um, in your boundary. Not but quite, it's a, but yeah, garden, very close. But it's a garden. It's open to the public, um, and we've arranged an event there. I mean, obviously, it's fingers crossed that uh, COVID will allow us to go ahead with this. Um, but the event is on Sunday, the eleventh of July. Um, from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock and we'll be doing guided butterfly walks within the actual garden itself um, and also we're hoping to uh, run a moth trap um, the night before and we'll have the opportunity to actually show people some of the some of the moths which uh, as uh, Dave will <laughs> certainly tell you are in every way just as spectacular and interesting mm -hmm. as the um, as the butterflies um, so uh, so that's an event which um, as I say we're organizing we hope um, this uh, summer it'll be and it'll be open to the public and you know if people are interested then uh, then please come along on that day fantastic thank you um I'm just writing a quick note in the chat. I'm going to add uh, the Transform and the Trent Valley website into the chat. Um, maybe Dave or Mike, you could pop the Butterfly Conservation website in there as well, so people can yeah, click onto yeah. that. Um, that. And uh, Mary has asked if um, you'll send any links regarding butterflies to look for specifically in the Midlands. So potentially, um, if there's a, a list, then Dave, maybe you could send them to me and I could send it out tomorrow when I send the feedback form out. I could include that. Or if there's any. Yeah, any certainly. Is there anything? Yeah. I mean, you say this this talk is going to go out again. So uh, being recorded, isn't it? So we should yes. be able to. Yeah. 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 Back, so, but... yeah. So, yeah, this this talk. I think the best the source. Of... Oh, sorry. Go on, yeah. go on, please, Mike. Yeah. Sorry, can I just say, I think the best source of um, local information is probably the West Midlands Butterfly Conservation website, um, which is www.westmidlands-butterflies.org.uk. And that has a sort of full list of all the butterflies that are actually found in the West Midlands counties um, and has uh, distribution maps and some of the life cycle details, which um, Dave has uh, covered in his uh, talk. So that's a really good source of local information, which um, um, people can, uh, can can look at. Brilliant. Could you just repeat that um, that website so I can type it and pop it in the chat box as well? Yeah. www. Yeah. West Midlands, all yeah. one word, hyphen butterflies, yeah. dot org, dot UK. Brilliant, thank you. Fab. So, uh, one last one. Can we have the details written down for the Go Dorothy Garden Place, please? Uh, where can we get the books from? Yeah, where can people can people order the books from the Butterfly Conservation website then? If they look at that website I've just given you, the uh, the local one, then they will. Yeah. Um, so there's the, the Butterfly Book for the West Midlands, which uh, um, Dave has, uh, has spoken about. Um, we've also just recently produced this, if people can see it, which is the Moths of the uh, of the West Midlands, which is a sort of companion um, volume um, to the uh, to the butterfly uh, butterfly book. Um, we also have something else which um, people might be interested called Walking with Butterflies, which is actually a well, as the name suggests, a guide to walks. You know, within the West Midlands area, where you can see butterflies, um, which um, people will find interest. So, so there's 40 walks um, around the uh, West Midlands, which are actually listed in this, including some in Staffordshire. Wow. Thank you very much. And the the but the all of that get on the website. Yeah, perfect. And the details of the guided walker on the website as well. But in in July, the one you mentioned. Uh, well, it might not be yet because we've only just made the arrangement to, as of this week. But yes, it will be um, promoted there, and uh, and obviously we're just going to keep every finger crossed that cross, we're going to be able to go ahead with it. Fab. One more thing, I'm going to pop in the chat box is just a quick feedback form. So um, it's it's really, really helpful and really lovely for us to get your feedback on these talks. And people have been really, really kind in the chat um, and written great comments so far. But if you do fancy clicking on that, um, I'll again, I'll send it out again tomorrow. So you have it in an email. But 
Um, it's really helpful for us to get feedback on these talks uh, so you can give us uh, any suggestions for future topics or um, just so we can make them better in the future as well. So you can do that now if you, if you like, uh, or I'll send it out again an email, email tomorrow as well. Is there anything, anything else I've missed in the chat? I tried having children in here tonight, a little too young. Um, so hopefully what we're also going to be doing with Transforming the Trent Valley is doing some family Trent talks. So family friendly talks like this, which are a bit more uh, interactive, um, engaging for kind of craft activities and, and children friendly talks, really. So we've got our first one actually this Saturday. We're doing one linking to the Big Garden Birdwatch and it's family friendly. It's there for your kids and parents to come together and do some activities and learn a little bit about wildlife with us. So um so maybe we'll be able to develop one for what for butterflies as well. All right, one moment, Neil, I'll just get you that link. Has anyone on any anyone left on the call seen any of the uh, the rarer butterflies or like the marbled white? I think is lovely. My parents live down on in the south coast, so I see it down there. But I think it's beautiful every time I see it. Well, it's certainly something which is spreading. Uh, we've had a number of sightings now in Staffordshire. Um, some, something to look out for. It's amazing the way it has expanded its range. Um, when I first got interested in butterflies, which was many, many years ago, um, around sort of uh, the 1980s, you could draw a kind of east-west line through Worcester and say with confidence you'd never see marbled whites north of that. Whereas now, as David has been saying, you know, it's well into uh, to Staffordshire um, and to, uh, to Shropshire. Um, and whether it's going to be could perform eventually like the comma and reach <laughs> southern Scotland mm -hmm. remains to be seen but but it's extraordinary um you know the way things are actually changing with um, within sort of nature and wildlife and it's not all bad news I mean there's quite a lot of that around which we all kind of recognize um but certainly on the back of um, of climate change and global warming certainly insects um do seem to be in many cases expanding their uh, expanding their range so we've seen um butterflies moving northwards and, and as far as moths are concerned we've actually seen new species um actually coming into the into the region which had never been recorded before so it's a fascinating time I think to be mm. studying um, insects uh, generally um, mm. and a lot of enjoyment to be had but also a lot of quite important science um, which everyone can actually contribute to um, which I guess you know, brings us back to the kind of recording uh, idea yeah, as well. Absolutely. I think but people have to realise that um, <coughs> it's the amateur I'm a naturalist who's the key to a lot of this because, you know, we, we need the data and uh, it's, it's the likes of us who are, who are actually getting it. And um, so it's really important that people tell us what they've seen. As I said, keep saying it's no good stuck in your notebook. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so do, you know, tell people what you've seen. Yeah, it's it's something that I'm working on myself. So I was as guilty as anybody else of being at, wanting to go out and know what everything was and learn to identify things, but never doing anything with the information. So it's it's just another habit to try and to learn and develop, isn't it? You know, you start off with one or yeah. one or two records and then get into the habit of doing it. You know, one or two on your walk and then and then grow from there. But yeah, it's. I mean, in the old you... days, it was all done in your notebook, and you've had now had to transpose it into digital where today it can go straight into digital. Uh, I've just transferred 30,000 bird note records of mine into bird track, which is the equivalent of I record for birds. 
it's, lockdown has allowed me to do is <laughs> give me the time, but it's got to be digitally digital now, so you can search and so on. It's uh, so much easier and, uh, for people to do that. Makes it a lot uh, more there's accessible. There's an app for it? Mm -hmm. it is uh, the Butterfly Conservation app is there it's got pictures there's an app for grasshoppers and crickets which even has the sound hmm. so you can play the sound and listen to it and put a tick in it that you've seen it it records your location it's never been easier uh, just needs the discipline to do it I've just seen uh, Pete's uh, message uh, come up on the uh, on the chat um, about um, a follow up um, email to people that to take part. I don't know whether that's uh, uh, possible or not uh, with yeah. all kind of website links and so on. Yeah. It's just uh, sound to be a good idea. I'll, I'll absolutely do that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll keep I'll take everything out of the chat, all the links and everything and, and the information. I'll put it all in a single email and I'll send that out to everybody who's attended tomorrow. So you've got it in one place. But yes, it's uh, usually a lot of things come up in these conversations and we want to send all the links out straight away, but I'll, I'll put it all in an email for you. Fantastic. Great stuff. Wonderful. Well, I think that's that's a, a pretty good place to stop then um, and call it an evening. So thank you very much uh, to Dave and, and to Mike as well for staying and answering the questions and for such an interesting presentation. It's Butterflies are not something that I'm particularly strong at identifying and have looking at these this evening again I think I'll need a bit of work and I need to get a guide myself but it's lovely to um to to see all of the different species that we might be able to pop out and see in our area so massive thank you to Dave for, for delivering yeah, this talk this evening. It is about confidence and I think this sort of session is just what you need to get people in to give them the confidence and a rounded view of what's going on nationally and locally and everything else and gives us the inspiration to go out there and do it. So thank you very much. It's been a lot, been very inspirational for me. Thank you. Great. Thank Absolutely. you, Val. And I hope to see you at uh, future talks as well. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Like, See you Brilliant. later then. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. And I hope to see you again soon. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Big thank you to Dave. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.